And this is our plan of attack. Banks have become an essential threat to our democracy. So consider this justice. Thank you for listening to Revolution Radio, freedomslips.com, the number one listener-supported radio station on the Internet. Please help support this station so this battle can continue forward. Revolution Radio! Extendivite really works. Just listen to what some people have to say. Several years ago, I was developing a very uh, severe situation. I called it my flippy heart. It just was doing not good things. And I did not want to go to a medical doctor because uh, I just knew they would give me a cover-up pill. I didn't want to get onto that sort of thing at all. When I learned it was garlic and cayenne, and cayenne is a healer. It is a wonderful herb. I said, I think I'm on to something here. I'll tell you, I wouldn't be without it. It did wonderful things for me. Extendivite is only $69.95 for a two-month supply of either capsules or liquid. Call now. That's 1-877-928-8822 or visit heartdrop.com. Extend your life with Extendivite. The opinions expressed on this radio station, its programs, and its website by the hosts, guests, and call-in listeners or chatters are solely the opinions of the original source who expressed them. They do not necessarily represent the opinions of Revolution Radio and FreedomSlips.com, its staff, or affiliates. You're listening to Revolution Radio, FreedomSlips.com, 100% listener-supported radio, and now we return you to your host. Welcome to Sacred Matrix, a divine paradigm of love and universal consciousness, with your host, Janet Kira Lesson and Dr. Sasha Lesson. Together, we transform the world. And now, here are your hosts, Janet Kira and Dr. Sasha Lesson. Sacred Matrix on Revolution Radio, and I'm your host, Janet Kier Lesson, with my co-host, Dr. Sasha Alex Lesson, and our producer is a mad painter, Thomas Becker, and our guest today is Laurie McDonald, and this is Revolution Radio. Um, let's see, I want to tell you a little about Laurie before we bring her on. Laurie McDonald is a board-certified clinical hypnotherapist at True U Hypnotherapy and an extraterrestrial abduction researcher. She is one of 27 regression therapists listed on the MUFON mental health referral list for abduction regression. She is a support consultant to the research committee Free, the Edgar Mitchell Foundation for Research into Extraterrestrial Encounters, and she is the board president for OPUS, Organization for Paranormal Understanding and Support, and is the founder of the Sacramento Alien Abduction and Contact Support Group, which is one of California's largest UFO and abduction groups. She's been a facilitator facilitator, and I can't speak today, woo, <laughs> of several experiencer events and hosted contact in the desert, and she's a lifelong experiencer. I'm going to get Sasha on here really quick here so I can take a drink. I think I'm dehydrated. Sweetheart, are you there? Sound check. Yes, I am. Uh, uh, I tell you, uh, Laurie, the things that uh, you're into, one of the things that really uh, strikes me is um, I've been studying Angkor Wat, uh, which uh, they, they uh, Cambodians uh, say ultimately an Anunnaki, uh, half Anunnaki named Freya, uh, laid out everything with, uh, he had a chemical, uh, kind of, um, cement and he made these mile long walls continuous and then it hardened and, uh, it goes on and on. The most amazing story about how 
the king had to walk up all these stairs, and it was really exhausting. And then he had to make it with the goddess there, and if he failed, he would never come down. Anyway, <laughs> tell us about your vat and what it was like to go there and actually be there. It was truly an amazing experience. Um, Angkor Wat, of course, is the crown chakra of the planet Earth. So the energies and the ley lines there are absolutely amazing. There's a, a buzz in the air. Um, it's, I happened to be there at a time when, for some reason, nobody was there. I found myself alone in one of the main temples and climbed all of those stairs. And I was sitting up in a little room with this magnificent view of all of the temple grounds and the surrounding temples. And I was meditating and I turned around to get up and a candle was sitting in the middle of the room and it was lit and it was not lit uh, when I had gone into the temple. And I found that uh, extraordinary. It didn't freak me out. In fact, it, it made me feel really quite peaceful and very grounded. Wow. It feels like there's wow. portal energy there. Um, in fact, very yes. dimensional. I think that I, I'm quite sure that there's a, a portal in that area. And that was one of the things that we, we were researching. We were deep in the jungles in Vietnam and, and found another area where there was such been a portal, one that had been opened during Vietnam accidentally. And, um, so, yeah, some of the energies in the area were very interesting, some very subtle, and others truly gross. So you couldn't help but but feel them. So it's an amazing sacred area. We loved uh, Southeast Asia. Uh, my son is in Thailand now. He's just finished teaching his first semester on uh, natural health and uh, English. <laughs> so we kind of see that we're trying to get that travel bug out of us but we can't our whole family seems to have it now and we're planning on some further research trips <laughs> you, when you wow, went to Cambodia exciting. and Vietnam uh, did you feel the ghosts of all those people that, that, that died there you know absolutely there's an energy for that but we also went to hundreds of temples and so there's a way of approaching energies like that, um, a way of entering with a equanimous, a peaceful state of mind where we're there just to experience. I mean, once in Cambodia, we were way, way off the beaten track and as far as a, a motorcycle could take us, then we were on foot and we hiked into the most treacherous cave because we were told that at the base, at the bottom, there was the most ancient of temples that had been engraved by prehistoric man even. But they had all of these Hindu overtones and elephants and so forth. And and so we went into them and it was really, truly life-threatening. I mean, we found the temple. It was magnificent it was too difficult to get good pictures but in order to leave we had to go through a hole and we had this little 12 year old guide and he said no come on come through this way it's a shortcut and I can hear the gravel falling over the sides of the rocks and then splashing at the bottom <laughs> I mean it's like as dark oh as wow. can be I'm like do you have a Indiana flashlight Jones. no it was yeah, Indiana, scared Indiana Jones. But yeah, he's, I'm like, do you have a flashlight? And he's like, no, no, I've done this lots of times. And so we moved into it and I started to go through it and, um, the walls were like wet. You couldn't hold on to anything. And so you literally had to stand on a rock sort of suspended. So we backed out of that took another exit, which was not nearly as treacherous, but we were leaping three or four feet at a time from one cliff to another as we descended to find a path that would lead us out. So, I mean, Cambodia is, there's no regulations or rules for anything like that, and it's just off you go. Wow. So, wow. 
we're lucky you're here. <laughs> yeah, it was really great all though. Kinds of stories. Well, that's why I went, you know, was to hear their stories. And one of the things about being an abduction researcher, I've always said it's difficult to, to, to filter through the cultural, religious, spiritual beliefs of an individual or an experiencer. And on some of the remote islands like, um, Koh Rong San Leon, which is just, um, uh, fishermen and had been like that for, for a millennium and they were saying that they were seeing lights uh, come out of the water and go into the sky and lights from the sky going into the water. Um, they have no formal education. There's two things they know of the ocean and the sky. And when they're reporting anomalies and trying very difficult to express what they think or what they feel it is, you could definitely feel, um, their uncertainty, the fear vibe, some of them are so suspicious that they didn't even like to discuss it. But others who who felt that that it was extraterrestrial. Wow. What do you think happened with that um, that candle? Huh. Who lit the candle? I'm stuck back there. It's like, wait, the candle got lit. We can't just get past that. You know, um, I honestly don't know, but it's not the first time it happened. Uh, one time back in 1994, I was having a experiencer meeting and the strangest thing happened. Um, I all of a sudden like stood up to my stood on my feet and I felt like this energy coming in and it's like I could see a three-dimensional human body. I could see it sort of x-ray. I could see it sort of lift and move so I could view a different perspective. And all of these colors were associated with major organs and systems. And so I started saying everything that I was seeing and what color vibrated at what for what reason. And as I paused to catch my breath, uh, the candle on the table lit. <laughs> and I couldn't register it because this information kept coming and I think it was probably the first download that anybody ever heard about way before it was called that and I've never said it was a download but it's but in retrospect mm -hmm. it certainly feels like that but uh, yeah the candle lit then and I thought it must have been ET and but at the temple uh at Angkor Wat I, I think that it must have been ET again <laughs> because I think that uh, what we consider or some of the uh, ancient people that referred to the gods were just extraterrestrials and, and shame on okay. them for allowing the people you know to uh, uh, worship them and call them gods. I mean, that's a, a big misstep on, on their mistake. So some bad parenting and, and those Anunnaki and other who were involved should be reprimanded a wee bit for their uh, egos uh, getting into the way. <laughs> I mean, because come on. How, do you, how, how would we tell them? I mean, how would they control? It's kind of like a cargo cult, right? They're gone for so long. They withdrew. And that's one of the things that humans naturally do is when it's a mystery, they start filling in the gaps and worshiping things, you know, like you're aware of what a cargo cult is, right? Yes. Yeah. Yeah. How they, they left behind a plane and then people came back 50 years later. And yeah. Yeah. Still waiting for that plane. And they're worshiping spam. The plane. Absolutely. Right. So that's, yeah. you I know, don't know if they intended uh, us to go and turn them into the gods or. Yeah, yeah, that's uh, that's uh, a topic of uh, discussion. What you, go ahead, Sash. Uh, well, what, what, uh, what uh, Enki uh, said, uh, he educated a special group of of his sec of the second Ad Adam. His name was Adapa uh, descendants, and he told them the truth about everything. Um, uh, I I bred you so that uh, when the time was right, your descendants. Uh, could be more compassionate and telepathic than we Anunnaki who are obsessed by greed uh, and hierarchy. And when the time's mm -hmm. right, it's inside of you. Those of you who are uh, carry this knowledge will come forth, like you're coming forth, uh, Laurie, uh, and, and uh, it's time. And that's the download that we get from within us because we have uh, the fractal of the, um, the uh, greedy and hierarchically obsessed uh, 
part and uh, the enlightened uh, telepathic compassionate empathetic part i think oh absolutely and there's a very specific potential that the awakening part of the human race is sensing right now they're sensing it some can't quite put their finger on it they can't grasp it totally but they know that this energy is moving you might say on one hand we're evolving we're experiencing a a shift of our reality a, a consciousness expansion people are experiencing a fluidity of time even but above all that i think what we're seeing is the multi-dimensional self that we're understanding the human, the light embodied being. You know, I do like to always clarify that when I do use the word human, I use it as I believe it was meant to be, hue as in how we measure light, the depth or saturation light, and man short for manifestation to be embodied or to come into the physical. So, a light embodied being, a human, just the definition of the type of entity we are at the moment and gender, race are just subcategories of that. So the human right now is experiencing that multidimensional self, that peace that's above transcending both space and time. And I think it might be even beyond what the Anunnaki ever suspected. I mean, there's oh, yeah. one... Right, absolutely. So the one common denominator in the thousands of cases uh, that I've worked and that other people have worked, no matter what extraterrestrial is involved, and we can name 10 or 12 of them right now if we want, but the common denominator is the human. It's that light and body being. All of these different races are interested in us, not because we're going to self-destruct, but because we won't self-destruct because we are stepping into our power now in a peaceful non-judgmental way we're allowing people to begin that uh, that unfolding into that higher self and that's the change so a lot of people are call it many different things uh, but i believe it's a natural spiritual consciousness evolution <laughs> Yeah, so you're I, I getting sure. indicators. Go even ahead, even the, the challenges that we're facing now are of a magnitude to force us into the singularity where we regulate our affairs from love instead of uh, competition. Right. Absolutely. And it's that problem, though, is that duality. So people are raised um, to misunderstand a competition. And it's very hard. You know, if a person is very good at something and they confidently express that then other people may uh, not receive that so well it may make them feel insecure or trigger their lack of ability in some area and so it's now a person who is competent is has to not speak their truth for fear that they may trigger somebody so it's that we're at a very precarious time right now so it's time for the walking wounded and everybody who's experienced some trauma to just relax and begin to do that emotional healing. I think that. Uh, yeah, well, that's what I, it's, that I agree with. I really, I, I notice people, you can see if they're coming from their walking wounded inner child, if, if they're walking through life through their wound or if they're centered. And, and when they're walking through their life wounded, they project it out and, and they have the reaction when someone is just living in their personal truth. So then that has a, like you said, there's someone who's, um, you know, athletic or talented in some way. And now the person that's talented or athletic doesn't necessarily need to let the person that's wounded stifle their, you know, their light, you know. Well, that's um, it. Yeah, it's balance, it's- yeah. Absolutely. And it's all root chakra work. I mean, that inner child work. That inner if, child work. If, if the adult is not 
in emotional control, it's because the root chakra is underactive or overactive and anyway out of balance. So all of the emotions mm-hmm. of an adult will be led by a child. So it's very important to to do that work. No shame, no blame. Let's just, you know, move through it, get the work done. There's a, a time for everything. So why not take some time to heal and see if we all can't just feel a little bit better? Yeah, you, you know, it's interesting. You could, uh, the one way to harness competition is to not make it painful. For example, let's say that, uh, everybody on earth is in competition with Thanatos, <laughs> with premature dying, uh, and we mm-hmm. all got a team together or we're going to snuff, so let's do it. You know, so we can compete to see, uh, when I was in Fiji, uh, the two sides of the village would have a contest to see who could build what, uh, what, which half of the, uh, meeting roof first and the winners, uh, got feasted. The, the, uh, losers had to make a big party for the winners. That's how you can harness competition rather than make it bad. You know, there was nothing in the human condition is alien if we get down to its, uh, base motive. And the base motive of competition is probably excellence. Well, yes. I mean, with my granddaughters, I teach them some Amazon warriorous games, uh, knife throwing, sword wielding, uh, some lassoing. And although they're very competitive because these sports, you're in a continuous offensive. You're moving, moving forward uh, because you don't want to have to be, be put in the place to have to defend. You know, so it's a continuous moving forward. It's really brought them um, into a uh, of, of confidence that <laughs> of their own ability to to learn. I mean, it's wonderful. They're little. I mean, they're six and nine. But to be able oh. to throw a knife uh, is a very important. I mean, it just all started one day. We were out in the park, and um, I had taken the dog off the leash, and I showed them what, how you can turn it, the you know, the leash into a lasso. So I told Wayne, you know, my husband, hey, run, because I'm going to take you down with the leash. And he's like, don't do it, Lori. And I'm like, I'm doing it. Just just run. So, I, you know, you lassoed it a few times and I let it go just around the knees. And so he couldn't run and he fell. And the girls just cheered and screamed and they wanted to learn so badly. So I thought. That that you know, I know it's a little weird. Not your how normal. did you learn how to lasso? I wouldn't know how to lasso. I have <laughs> no idea. I have a, a ranch. I'm an I have an inner Amazon. I don't know, man. Uh, but um, I have a a spiritual women's retreat coming up in October called Embrace Your Inner Amazon, and definitely um, for the activity part of the retreat of course this part is voluntary <laughs> um, i will be do, showing them some some ways to throw knives and a little bow and arrow stuff to maybe embrace their inner artemis and uh, see if they can't feel a little bit more confident and strong and who knows it feels good to let that arrow yeah, that's fly great <laughs> Well, you know, and I don't know how children are raised now, but when I was a <laughs> child, I was very athletic, and my sister was, and we used to beat the boys, but then you kind of got shamed out of it, and the boys would be shaming each other of a girl. So that got stifled in the uh, children of the 60s, right? So it would be great for you to encourage that. I love, yeah. love it. I love what you're doing. Yeah, I think it's uh, very empowering. And ultimately, uh, all of the work that I do, whether it's with the uh, abductees or contactees, it's really about empowering, uh, getting a, the person to a place where they're comfortable, they're learning from their experience, uh, they're taking control of it. And again, moving forward, they're not stuck, they're not insecure, they're not wondering why, 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 why me, why them. But get them to a place where you take the extraterrestrial experience and use it to to measure, gauge your reality, and then to really push into an expanded consciousness, but from a place of empowerment. So there's a lots of techniques people can learn to diminish fear, to legitimize fear, to 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 know if it's a real fear or an imagined fear. There's little protocols. So, um, you know, 
five steps to personal empowerment is is wow. one of the workshops that I've been working on. I, in fact, um, I just did a, a month in what, China what and they pulled it. What are the five steps? Uh, the first, are they? first step is uh, self-awareness and self-acceptance. See, I'll tell you what, you cannot change what you cannot accept. So to really become aware and to know the self, so it's self-awareness, self-acceptance, and then we move into self-development. And however that might be, whether you're going in for hypnotherapy sessions, whether you're learning, pushing your own telepathy, who knows what that might look like for somebody. But self-development, then eventual self-mastery, and then self-actualization. And self-actualization is living in an empowered place where you can let anybody be what they need to be around you and you can be yourself it's not judging somebody inferior or superior but really experiencing and sharing mercy and and compassion and some people may think those are weak emotions but those are the strongest emotions to understand it's only a person who has experienced and overcome can really have mercy on somebody else who's in pain right. so, these are big things so yeah you know uh, so self-actualization is living the life that you saw yourself living for me honest to god i wanted to be a hypnotherapist I wanted to have an office in a clinic. I wanted to explore the things in the world that interested me. And I wanted to help other people. And so I'm on my You're path of that. I'm doing it. Um, yeah, every day, a little bit more. <laughs> uh, Stop, let me, uh, let me thank ask you. a I question. I know you uh, have a lot of questions. Oh. You wanna, I want to ask a question now. My turn. We <laughs> 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 have to go back and forth. <laughs> um Wait, is there okay, a talking so, stick? No, we we have an invisible one. Yes, we okay. have an invisible talking stick, and okay. and Laurie's a very exciting guest, so we're we're going to be going. Yes, let's talk. Um, mm -hmm. <laughs> so I uh, so you're you're let me give me back up here. So you're you're having all these people come in. They're having extraterrestrial encounters, experiences, and paranormal mm -hmm. stuff, and you're taking that uh, on into their childhood and, and family of origin and cultural conditioning and religious programming and right. helping them deconstruct and, and reintegrate and, and uh, become aware. I love it. Why are we going to do the intensive re, uh, workshops? <laughs> I've been wanting to build a team that we go really deep into it, you know, not just the, the you know, the little event that's all at a conference where you're sitting around in chairs, but something where you're really – Dive yeah, into it. Uh, well, that's what my re to, uh, four day weekend. That's what the retreats are like, you know. Um, I do them with uh, Holly Marie. She's a female shaman. She's also a, a hypnotherapist, and uh, we usually have another teacher. It's, we, it's the power of three presents. Uh, we've used different teachers. Mm -hmm. We've had Laura Eisenhower at one retreat, and our our special teacher for the next retreat, it, we're hoping that she'll say yes, so is uh, Regina Meredith. Uh, she's a, mm -hmm. an amazing, um, insightful person, and I think that uh, she has a lot to share. So, yeah, if these retreats are deep. We get right into it, and we clear that energy, and we give you back your power so that you can be at ease in your mind and body because I believe that is a fundamental human right in that all healing of the mind or the body has to begin from a place of peace, from a place of relaxation, letting all those energies calm down, letting the emotional body just relax. And just sort of suspend things for a bit and we can go and do the work then that's necessary. You know, it's, it's always humbling when we see we're working with these women and they never once, their inner child was never told, you know, that she was a good girl. 
that she was such a good little girl or the inner child, if he's a boy, <laughs> such a good boy. You know, I'll tell you, when they begin to hear that and absorb that into the root chakra, what they're hearing is, I have value. I'm important. I have worth. I'm a good girl. I'm good enough. You know, so mm-hmm. we do, uh, you know, I can do a whole hour meditation on one word, but We'll do a word, say, like the word enough and begin to change the energy around that word so that you feel you are always good enough. If you look at the food on your plate, then you think that's probably enough. If I wake up at four o'clock in the morning, instead of creating angst and anxiety in my mind and body and trying to force myself back to sleep for those next two hours, I think to myself, well, maybe I've got enough sleep for now. And I get up. That's wonderful. (laughs) That little energy shift creates that deeper calm that can then begin to sort of run through the mind and body that your reactions and come from that place. Uh, just by thinking, I have enough time. I'll have enough money. I have enough food. I'm, I'm good enough. I was born enough. And these things relax that inner dialogue that can run wild and create fear and anxiety. So what's happening with the experience or contactees? What's new? Well, I think that people are really changing how they go about viewing their experiences. You know, I think that there's so much information out there. There's so many wonderful people sharing everything, so many wonderful experiencers that are sharing their story, that they're beginning to really relax and tell their truth that's a big change i mean it it's always been this energy of fear and ridicule and you know people are going to make fun of you or you're so different or or whatever Mm -hmm. the case may be and i think that's really being lifted i mean look at the people now almost two million people signed up to storm area 51 which i'm not advocating don't go storming area (laughs) don't storm area 51 don't do it but I will say they're going to have the best UFO party in Rachel, Nevada. They're already renting out um, the area around the inn for for RV parking and so forth. And and I know the good thing about it, of course, it's it can raise awareness into the mainstream, make them start asking those questions again, maybe changing their mind, but storming it, why that's just straight up anarchy and we can't be doing that. Right. Yeah, we can't be doing that. (laughs) (laughs) We don't want anybody to get hurt. Don't show the storming it. No, we'll figure out something else. (laughs) Right. Yeah. Yeah, and, And I'm not sure. To be honest, um, at this point, if there's anything that extraterrestrial there, I mean, maybe some technology, big deal, but probably not um, too many ETs. I think they're at different bases. <laughs> yeah, they move things around. And it's, it's so, I've been to the underground bases. You're not going to find anything. They, they have areas where you're walking and suddenly you're teleported and you're on the other side of the planet. You know, it's like it's way beyond anything you can imagine. So I wouldn't go. Cause, yeah. Uh, you know, they're just going to... I heard they, I hope they don't hurt anybody or arrest anybody, but it's kind of... But it's fun. It's probably... I think the two million people, some of them just said, yes, I'm coming, but they're just saying that. They're not really going to go. No, I, I think they're saying that... I think they're just saying they're interested because just to to raise interest. Yeah, they're not really planning on showing up, although I, I do know some uh, people who are uh, renting an RV and driving down to see what happens because they can. <laughs> and when is that going to happen, the storming of Area 51? <laughs> the the non-storming of Area is September 20th. <laughs> the, the, the non-storming okay. of Area 51 is, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> So, and um, and, and what's, what's behind that date? Do you have any idea why they chose September? Is that like 
It's the day Happy after my birthday. Of Roswell. <laughs> oh, because it's the day after Laurie's birthday. Yes. <laughs> of course, that's when we have to do it. <laughs> it's my birthday week. <laughs> it's not Burning Man or anything. It's just. <laughs> it's my birthday week. Maybe it's kind of like a Burning Man. <laughs> <laughs> we do have a good time. That sounds good. Well, I've had a lot of uh, whistleblowers that have said they've been in Area 51. Do you have any contactee experiencers on, on your uh, couch that are, you know, super soldiers or have been in the my, my labs and anybody been to Area 51? Oh, oh definitely. Um uh, well, they don't know Area 51. Uh, they suspect it's Area 51, uh, could be Dulce. Uh, but they do right. feel this, uh, sense of getting, um, maybe in a mountain sometimes or like down, down. And they feel like they're moving down underground. They don't know how many floors down, maybe seven, maybe ten. And um, maybe more. I don't know. But they get these sensations. And, and so, yeah, in a session, what I try to do is have them just rotate their perspective so they can pick up other clues, other information around, especially in facilities like that. Um, you know, when I did uh, Whitley, he um, was able to zoom in on some a military insignia, which I'm only saying because he oh, already did. talked about it on his show. Whitley, Whitley Street. Whitley, Whitley Street. Yeah, Can you absolutely. regress him? Oh, I, I I'll did, tell yes. us about that. Oh, that's- <laughs> <laughs> oh no kidding. <laughs> okay, yeah. So uh, we met uh, several years back at, at Contact uh, in the Desert, and he had heard somebody, uh, he had talked to somebody that had already regressed, and he was very excited. In fact, every workshop he did he was telling everybody i'm going to go see Lori, and so he did uh he came in because he was traveling in lax and first class and <laughs> he whitley's adorable he's traveling first class he lands in lax and um he he gets off the airplane takes a quick jot into the men's room and heads directly to pick up his bags. And when he gets there, there's nothing on the carousel, but the carousel still sort of chugging along. And he looks to the side and he sees a man standing there like a porter with his bags. And he said, Mm -hmm. Oh, is this because he's so sweet. He said, Oh, is this part of the new first class service? You take our bags off first for us, right? I'm like, are you serious? Right. And uh, they're like, uh-huh. no, uh, these bags have been gone for 45 minutes. These are unclaimed. Oh. And he's like, what? So he lost 45 minutes and he was first off the plane. And that was that. The time was gone. And so we were able to retrieve all of those uh, 45 minutes. Well, seemingly, uh, we retrieved all of those 45 minutes. I won't say that there's not a stone that wasn't unturned, but um, we did sort of fill in the blanks. And and uh, there were extraterrestrials and some form of military involved. And there was like a, a door that opened from nowhere into somewhere. Well, what did they want to do? Why did they want to get him off of a plane? Did, uh, what did you find out? You know, they couldn't let the man get his own luggage before they take him. <laughs> you know, what was that about? I don't know. I mean, I think that sometimes um, with the abduction phenomena, there's a huge psychological part of the abduction phenomena. It's usually done by mantis and reptilian, uh, where they're really more into the psychological testing as opposed to sort of that genetic harvesting that we've heard uh, quite a lot about. Oh, and, yeah, it's lots of different reasons, not just genetics, yeah. Right. Especially when it, you're older, they're not that concerned about your genetics. Right. <laughs> Help me. <laughs> yeah, no, so um, they... Um, we're doing some like psychological mind games uh, with him. And I think it's really testing his perception of reality, 
how and how much they can control him and i mean he knew he lost the 45 minutes that was obvious i mean you don't get off a plane and lose 45 minutes without going you know you might lose 45 minutes if you're driving in a, a five-hour road trip and your mind is wandering, who knows, 45 minutes, you're not mm-hmm. really paying that much attention, okay? But getting off an airplane, we all know that energy is a little bit rushed because you know that you got to get to baggage first because your bags are going to be off first, and that's never the case. <laughs> you always see those people rushing, rushing, right. rushing. <laughs> but, uh, yeah, so, but there's that energy, and he was motivated to, and doing a task, and that was completely um, intervened, and he was sidetracked. And at first, you know, it really took him a bit to move in on the insignia. And um, I don't know, it's difficult to say, but it really sounded very familiar to me, uh, what he was describing, uh, as far as other people mentioning they get glimpses of, of uh, some type of uniform. We think it's military. It could be extraterrestrial military. It could be MPs. It's very hard to say. You would think that, in my mind, they wouldn't have any identifying markers like insignia, that it would all sort of be MIB stuff, you know, to, to create mm-hmm. a confusion. But many people have reported, especially people who say they've had extraterrestrial encounters with what they refer to as the Federation, the Galactic Federation. Um hmm those ETs are always in some form of a uniform. Well, even maybe the greys are wearing a uniform. We don't know. Huh. I don't, I've been, I've had abductions on a military base and I didn't encounter military uniforms. (laughs) It's like where I went, they went into the other direction. They went into um, like a ball and, and dresses. It was very interesting. I, you remember that. Uh, I remember yeah. you telling me very large beings also were there. But I didn't see any uh, uniforms, even on a military base. So anyway, this one was a military. A lot of people have military. But sometimes there are both extraterrestrial and military there. Yeah. Oh, I did. At the beginning of my experience, they were definitely military. The military people were um, with the the greys they were walking they were like protecting them walking alongside them mm-hmm. like they didn't really need protection no. they were just like walking with them uh marching mm-hmm. actually um the okay, tall so greys i'm assuming the the ones that carried me were the ones that were about my height so about five foot between four and five feet and there were okay. six of them and they okay. carried me like a surfboard but then when i got into the underground facility there were the shorter ones. I guess they're closer to three feet or something. Mm-hmm. And then there was a very tall mantis gray mix. Very tall. Very tall. Mm-hmm. Um, towered over everybody. But then I saw the, the Anunnaki. And anyway, I don't want to go into my experience. I want to stay focused on you. But um, so people are having a lot of military abductions. From my understanding, sometimes the military want to get... Uh, experiencers after they've had their ET abduction. So like they'll have an ET, I don't want to call it abduction experience, and the next day the military will want to see what they know, what they can remember. They re Right, absolutely. Yeah, I mean, yeah. not a lot. Uh, the, 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 my labs are smaller um, percentage of the cases that I get. I get a lot of uh, contactees, uh, a lot of people who have some sort of alliance uh, with a specific race. There's about seven or eight races that continuously come up. What I am getting a lot of is older people, Um, people in their 70s who have said, okay, I'm done. You know, I'm just going to. I'm just going to come forward now and start figuring this out because I my days are numbered and I need to know because something happened. I know something happened and I want to know what it was. You know, that little piece I did on Vice, uh, he was an older gentleman. I regressed somebody and, um, you know, and a lot of people don't realize it's for him, too. It was a, a bucket list thing. It was a dying wish. This was a man who's mm-hmm. sick, 
and very important, very important to him. Now, he, his mom and pa own the a gas station and cafe up on the intersection near Beale Air Force Base back in the 40s. And on the weekends, his mom would serve beer and, and keep the place open till 10 and, and the guys from the base would come and drink. And he would say, his mom would keep him up late to clean, wipe the bar and do the dishes and take the garbage out and so forth. And he said almost every night for a whole summer, there was these ex, these UFOs that would show up and then our guys would show up and it was just a game of cat and mouse. And he said it looked like, you know, they were just practicing maneuvers, but the UFOs were... You know, looking sometimes like a light and sometimes like a very classic UFO. Um, yeah, but sometimes just like white orbs. But yeah, we, there, so it's a, what I see is a push of older people wanting to settle this before they pass away. Oh, that's great. Yeah. So do you see a decline in the genetics program? That the ETs had earlier on, you know, well, the hybrids. Still, I still work very strongly in that uh, because those are still experiences that haunt people, uh, or they want to have more information. But I had a weird experience myself um, about three years ago at the Seti Ranch, and in the in the afternoon. I thought, you know, I'm going to go for a nap, which is so unlike me. And because I'm just like a rabbit, I have a lot, a lot of energy. Anyway, um, mm-hmm. I decided I was going to have a nap. I went and laid down. I had this like weird, extraordinarily lucid dream where I was sitting um, in a small examining room. I think like wax paper on the on the little table, just like any doctor's office. And she handed me um, like a clear circular, I don't know what the hell it was. It, it looked like a, a clear circular um, napkin ring. Okay? <laughs> and, but it was, <laughs> and, so, and so she handed this to me and told me to insert it. And I said, you want me to put that where? And in that moment, I became even more lucid and I looked her right in the face and she was totally a uh, gray hybrid because she had black hair with the bangs and then sort mm-hmm. of straight to the shoulders at about five, three. And she had a white lab coat on. And she wanted you to put it where? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> and so what? <laughs> I was like, I was having some gynecological exam there. So it, right, uh, yeah. It was that, you know, and I'm a bit of a a joker, a smart ass sometimes. And I was just sort of, Mm -hmm. you know, playing with her. But, and then do, oh, yes, this is important. Um, And when I Mm -hmm. said that, and I really like zeroed in on her and called her out and said, hey, you're a hybrid. It's not the first time I've done that Mm -hmm. in a dream. Uh, She started to change. Like her hair got like a little bit longer and she started to, take the facial features of my daughter. And I was like, I'm not buying this. Oh, um, they, they can, sh- oh, they can morph and shift. They're, they're very tricky. Wow. Yeah. Well, at least make me think I'm seeing that. I don't know if they're really changing or just making me think they're changing. That's another thing. Yeah. We don't know what they're doing. They're just seeing what they want you to see. That's right. So, well, I found that, you know, for me personally, I'll have that overwhelming need to take a nap. And the next thing I know, I'm being shown something like that. Um, so one time I was just compelled to take a nap and they, they took me to the future and they showed me this tower that worked on the thermals of the planet. And they said, this one powers this half of the earth and there's another one on the other side. And between these two giant towers, it provides all the energy we need for the entire planet. And I'm going, Please let me remember how to do this so I can teach people. But I have no idea how it works. But I know somebody somewhere is going to know how to work this tower that works on thermals. I can describe to maybe somebody who might figure it out. But um, 
Wow. And then I come back and, and you know, you know, it's like, and, and you're not sleeping for hours. You're just like, you know, half an hour and you've got this incredible experience and, and you're buzzing. And I, I have like a um, third eye chakra buzz. Like I've just returned from an acid trip. And I think they activate your DMT or something. That's all I can, I don't know what it is, but the, I'll have this energy where sometimes I'm, I'm traveling at night. I don't know if I'm physically gone. Sometimes it's, my, you know, Sasha's is in the back room. He's working in the office, and I'm having these experiences. And I mean, I'm just the, around a corner, but he doesn't come in and look at me. So I don't know if, if, if he were to come in, if I would be gone, or what would be going on. One of these days, he's going to catch me in one of these experiences where I'm, I'm literally on another planet, and I'm doing my other job. So I have different planets, different jobs, and so are you finding that people are on spaceships, different planets, and so I have. I, I have an apartment there. I, I know where my office is. I, I know these cities. I'm, I'm working on a relocation pro- project for if you want to go to another planet, like you're homeless or poor, you qualify. We're going to relocate you to these planets where they have – they once had large civilizations. And they, a lot of, all these buildings are, are great and they're abandoned and, you know, they're providing them for wow. free and the, all the food. And it's like – and I'm ahead of this project. So then I come back here and I'm just Janet. I go, wow, I was busy last night. <laughs> I was organizing, wow. you know, transportation. So, and, and I, I just left, I'm left with the, okay, you know, I talked to Sasha about it. So I'm glad I'm talking to you about it. But are you encountering uh, people, like you said, that you, you know, I'm 65. I'm going to be 70 in five years. I want to get it out there. What in the world has been going on? And it's well, massive. It's extensive. Well, I mean, scientists are telling us. At all. Yeah. The, no. Science is indicating that our brain reacts in quantum fields. And that when we sleep, we, we literally are astral traveling to another dimension. Mm-hmm. So the consciousness is leaving the body the soul and traveling and people who are understanding their uh, multidimensional self, such as yourself will be aware that uh, they have another position or they're uh, have a job or they're working. They're beginning to understand that they exist um, in multiple dimensions at the same time. Although I believe we have an alpha awareness that will allow us uh, to to that will indicate how deep we can begin to understand where we're going. I know that I I go places as well. <laughs> yeah, well, we're we're going to have to talk about a lot of that. Uh, we're coming up on a break in four minutes, but yeah, I would, I'm very interested about your personal experiences, but let we can reserve that for the second hour. Sasha, you haven't spoken for a while. I'm sorry I interrupted you earlier. I didn't mean to shut you up completely. Your turn. Oh, okay. <clears throat> yeah, I find it really uh, useful in terms of expansion when somebody uh, gives a production like uh, Janet just did about a building, and you know, and then if you if you you can just say if you know, let yourself identify with that building and. If the building could talk, what would you know, in, in, what's its existence? And, and so, in this way that it, uh, it, so I just put that out as a, as a way uh, 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 that I find to help people ex, uh, expand. Any little thing that you remember, the smallest part, can just be, open doors and doors and doors and doors. The other thing I wanted sure. to, to, to say before the break is is. You just, I'm still want to know. Would you say give us a a, a a a way of identifying with the Amazon woman within us, so that people <laughs> that's listening can get some sense of evoking that Amazon woman that we all have, if, if we all have them. <laughs> well, it's a, a combination of solar plexus and heart chakra work, because our truest powers really come from the heart. However, they're displayed. But uh, it's uh, solar plexus and heart chakra, and we do have these abilities. It's um, primal 
to survive. The, and we have these deep, innate instincts. And when we begin to play survival games like knife throwing or a lasso or, or, or you know, uh, swords, which are ancient, and the sword is associated with different spiritual beliefs, um, with knights and so forth, and, and being able to uh, have uh, that type of personal power does really help people feel a little bit more confident. And who knows, you know, and that's not all, though. Of course, embracing your inner, inner Amazon is exhibiting the truth to look at yourself no matter what, the good, the bad, the indifferent, mm-hmm. and just accepting it, just relaxing with it, not saying, oh, it's because of this, or if not for that, I would be this. No, none of those things matter, because here's the truth. The past no longer exists. It only lives in the mind. And we're either going to draw that energy and bring it back to ourselves daily, or we're going to take the root of self-correcting, and stepping into our personal power because that is a fundamental human right. Wow. wow. Beautiful. Thank you, thank you, thank you. You're welcome. So we're going to be coming up on the break in one minute. What would you like to cover in the second half of the show? A little preview of what's coming. Well, you know, um, we could look at some of that portal activity in uh, Southeast Asia. And I mean, that's got to keep people's head scratching. And you know what I find very interesting these days is the Mandela effect and uh, looking at the quantum field and, and what CERN is doing, how they're, you know, smashing those particles in the Haldron Collider, trying to basically create a tear. All right, we're making a note of that. We'll get to those things in the second half. We'll be back in five minutes. Nothing on us here at Revolution Radio Freedom Slips dot com. Enjoy your extra big ass fries. You didn't give me no fries, I got an empty box. Would you like another extra big ass fries? I said I didn't get any. Thank you. Your account has been charged. Your balance is zero. Please what? come back when you can afford oh, to make no, a purchase. No. I'm sorry you're having Come trouble. on. Thank you for tuning in to Revolution Radio. 
Here at Revolution Radio, we believe in freedom of ideas, freedom of speech, but above all, we believe in freedom of existence through self-reliance. This station is 100% listener-supported, and as a fundraising promotion, I have a kick-ass free gift for a $100 donation. 35,000 seeds. 25 years in the freezer. Long-term storable, 54 different varieties. So, if the prices go crazy, the shit hits the fan, or if you just want to save tons of money every year by creating your own food like I do, grab our seed pack special. Just look for the banner on the homepage at freedomslips.com. Don't be a statistic. Don't be part of the problem. Be part of the solution. We need to ask humans to start taking care of ourselves and not depending on the mega courts to provide unhealthy, nasty food. Included in this package is also a DVD with 900 survival and off-grid living documents and the offline home canning how to do everything website all on the DVD. So when you're growing all that food, you know how to can it, store it, preserve it, etc. with all these documents. So thank you for tuning in to Revolution Radio at freedomslips.com. I hope that you will pick up this package and start learning to be free. Revolution Radio, freedomslips.com, where information never sleeps and freedom is one seed that needs to be planted. What we do in life, it goes in eternity. for tuning in to Revolution Radio. Here at Revolution Radio, we are listener sponsored and commercial free, but there still are bills to pay. In order to raise some needed funds to cover the cost, our station is offering a silver special. In the continental United States for a $60 donation, or in Alaska, Hawaii, or Canada for a $70 donation, we will send you an uncirculated 2018 one ounce pure silver eagle. The $70 donation, uh, the extra 10 is to cover shipping, by the way, outside of the continental United States. When making the donation, you must put Silver Eagle promo in the notes on the donation. And thank you for tuning in to Revolution Radio at revolution.radio and freedomslips.com. Without you, there is no less. Revolution Radio, where information never sleeps. It happens more often than we can imagine. In my case, I was sitting at home, and out of nowhere, I just started feeling uncomfortable. Then it got worse, and I started perspiring. I tried to ignore it, but I waited too long. The chest pain came as we were driving to the hospital emergency. I felt my life clock begin to tick. I barely survived. There was lots of damage done to my heart. What do I do now? I was lucky. I took a leap of faith and tried a seven-herb formula with hawthorn, garlic, cayenne, and more called Extendivite. Herbs have been used for thousands of years to keep us healthy. If you're not using Extendivite as a preventative supplement, maybe it's time to start. To order, call 1-877-928-8822 or visit heartdrop.com. Extend your life with Extendivite. The opinions expressed on this radio station, its programs, and its website by the hosts, guests, and call-in listeners or chatters are solely the opinions of the original source who expressed them. They do not necessarily represent the opinions of Revolution Radio and FreedomSlips.com, its staff, or affiliates. You're listening to Revolution Radio, FreedomSlips.com, 100% listener-supported radio, and now we return you to your host. Hello, and welcome back to the Sacred Matrix on Revolution Radio, and I'm your host, Janet Kara Lesson, with my co-host, Dr. Sasha Alex Lesson, and our producer is Thomas Becker, a mad painter, and our guest today is Laurie McDonald. But before we get back to our show, I'd like to remind everybody to please go over to that donation button on revolution.radio and make your donation, because we really need your donations. Mad painter, are you there? 
Are we able to see how we're doing in our fundraising? Uh, no, ma'am. Hawk's still in the no. hospital, but he's improving. Oh, and, he uh, till he gets out, we have no clue because of the email. You know, you okay. can't answer his email in the hospital. <laughs> <laughs> but we do know we need your money, so please take it just a moment out of your day and donate something. Thank you. You know, I think that's oh. a great idea, Janet. You know, if it weren't for shows like this... It wouldn't give people like me an opportunity uh, to share my work, to bring the information to the other experiencers, people that relate to it, people who eventually can find help. And it is because of shows like yours. So if people can donate, please do. Thank you for that. That's great. Now, Sasha, are you back? Let's make sure you're uh, uh, Yes, yes definitely I'm back. And this so, is uh, the so this. And we're looking cover. forward to this segment. I'm doing whatever yeah, Janice says. Half went fast. Yes, well, I'm, going to, I'm going to take a little bit of this. How bad is it back? But I did want to get um, first of all. You were starting to tell us a pyramid story. Yeah. And I want to make sure we get your personal stories, and we got portals and Mandela effect, and there's something else. So we got a lot to cover. So finish your pyramid story, and of course, at the start, at the beginning, because they didn't hear you. The listeners didn't hear you. So what out of the pyramids, out of the blue, uh, client, I, I work five days a week um, at the office in the clinic in Sacramento, and I uh, got a gift from one of the clients. First time I'd seen them, so certainly didn't warrant a gift, that's for sure. But they brought me this beautiful little uh, organite um, or, uh, uh, pyramid. Then the next day, another client, unrelated to the first one, brought me the exact same size pyramid with amethyst and copper in it. And then I got a third. Then the fourth one was a very large uh, copper pyramid. Then I got a crystal pyramid. Altogether, I got seven different pyramids. And um, I just thought, what a strange coincidence or synchronicity and how very important this must be. And I play with them and lots of energy from them and I'm still trying to figure all that out because that was just very um, out there wasn't expecting something so unusual everybody at the office got a kick out of it though they were just like wow <laughs> <laughs> so you said that there's a portal in your office and you encountered portals in your travels yeah. let's focus on portals for the next few minutes here wait 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 wait, wait. just a, just a minute you know it's I, uh uh, David Wilcox like all these Ukrainian experiments that were done where uh, plants were uh, seeds were put under pyramids where people with diseases were put under pyramids with all these things that actually show this is a thing that happens with pyramids and it's not nonsense at all but it's it's real there's there there, there is power in pyramids. I absolutely I believe that I have a. Um sort of a past life affiliation with some of the pyramids. I remember a past life where actually the whole pyramid area was a marshland and the Nile was wide and water rushed under the main pyramid and it generated lights. And I believe that the obelisks um, around ancient Egypt, the ones that were capped with silver and gold were like antennas. There was a generator of great energy and it pulled both celestial energy or zero point scalar energy really as well as using water thermal and many of the different natural resources that the earth provides so the pyramids you know have always been important and significant and i certainly believe in the power the trihagathon condensing energy in the upper third of it and in really intensifying certain energies but yeah, so it must maybe maybe they'll help me open these portals. <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> mm-hmm. That's why I was leading into that. So the pyramids were giving you for some reason. Mm-hmm. Um, they all got that that was necessary, so they all brought the pyramids. You have seven. Yes, I do. What's the significance of seven? Right. So mm-hmm. what do you think? What's your conclusions? Well, I, I, I think that each one of them does have a, a specific energy 
and I've separated them. I have three together, then four together, and the energy is different um, when I do that. Uh, some have a, a copper coil in them, uh, working with crystal, and the ones that are working with the amethyst, the energy is softer, uh, softer vibration from it. So I, I'm learning. It uh, this recently just happened, and it, I'm still a, a work in progress with it. But perhaps it does have the ability to open certain portals. And I certainly believe that there are portals or some way that people or other entities come and go <laughs> between here and there. So what's happening in your office? I don't know. Just, there's a lot of activity. The clients um, are, I'm very calm, whatever's happening. I, I don't really pay any attention. I'm holding so much energy just with the client, but they're always saying it's like portal energy in here. It's like, it feels like something's opening. And that's what they say. They and right out and out have said it's like portal energy in my office. And I, I guess that's probably <laughs> a good thing. But I, um, I just do my job and, and carry on. If there's portal energy and a portal opens and something comes through, great. If not, I'm going to still do the same job. So, but it is very, very interesting. And, you know, I do, I really do believe that uh, there are certain portals. I really did feel that sense, um, not just at Angkor Wat, uh, but also in, in certain places in Laos. Um, I was at the ancient uh, plain of jars where they believe the giants roamed in ancient times. It's just off the Ho Chi Minh Trail. And these are huge, huge jars that they say the giants um, used for different storage. And you can walk around this ancient um, monoglyphic site and look at each one of these individual ruins and you'll see that beside them are huge craters where we dropped bombs, where we tried to ruin this jar of planes to try to make it disappear so we wouldn't have any any remembrance of maybe a time when there were giants there. But that is what people describe coming through those portals, especially in Southeast Asia, either giant beings 18 feet tall or giant insects which makes sense if it's like a giant dimension. I guess the bugs would be big too. But, um, yeah, that's what uh, they say. I'm not sure what dimension it is. But um, I do think that that is one of the commonalities among the Southeast Asia portals is the um, witnesses saying that the beings coming through are just gigantic. Wow. We don't think of insects coming through, but yeah. Well, I uh, had a Marine uh, report that uh, during Vietnam, uh, 150 of their troop were moving off uh, the DMZ near a little village in Vietnam called Camlo. And his job, his commander had sent him down and he was to watch to see if the enemy was approaching and then go back and report and they were holding their ground. And then I, he said the strangest feeling came over him and he just laid down on the jungle floor and he fell asleep. I said, what? There's a battle going on. I said, did you, did you lean up against the tree? Did you, did you tilt your helmet down? Did you make yourself comfortable? Did you like fall asleep in a way that sleep naturally occurs? And he said, no, I laid down on the jungle floor and I fell asleep. And when I woke up, smoke was rising. There were UFOs in the air shooting all over the place erratically. He hustled back to warn the other troops and his commander lined them up, 150 of them moving through the jungle. And he said they came across a gigantic mutilated like uh, insectoid, some type of beetle spider thing. 
and just uh, bigger than a Volkswagen. And that's how big the insects were. And they were all shot and killed, mutilated and stacked up on each other for, for, as if for deportation of some sort. So I've had two Marines uh, come and both have uh, very similar stories, both at the same time. It was Vietnam. It was 1969. And that's what happened in Camlo. So I went to Camlo and talked to different people and tried to get different stories translating. Very difficult. But um, it it's really, really go all over the world and talk to different people. And you move through all those different filters like we were talking about earlier. You get down to the truth. The truth is similar. Something is happening. There's an extraterrestrial presence on the planet. It, there are many forms of extraterrestrial presence on the planet. However, they might manifest in somebody's world. And they're here for a reason. And that reason uh, is multifaceted, but part of it is really to allow us to wake up, do our work, step into our power, take our rightful place cosmically, and move on with this. Because we can only live in this uh, treachery of sabotage and pain towards each other for a limited amount of time. I think the time now is for us to sort of, as if we were all in a wetsuit, to sort of unzip those negative emotions that no longer serve the highest purpose begin to step into the truer self, even if it's baby steps, just one step at a time until a person can really be what they were meant to be outside of their own uh, social programming. So there is a lot going on and all of it, I believe, is related to our evolution. But my family, like we were saying wow. earlier, does mm. come from, I mean, I learned uh, through different ways, um, different family members at different times in my life who was involved and who wasn't. But um, I just have the uh, prologue of some work I'm writing on. And I see what I wrote. I, I said, um, they come in the night. They take us. Sometimes we're levitated out of windows. Sometimes floated through walls. They say they come to all the women in my family. And this is a family truth that I've uncovered as far back as uh, 1939. And if I had the capability to do further research, I might find that even further ancestors of mine may have had uh, a very similar experiences. So but, your family is able to recall a lot of your members. I, I suspect the same thing. I know my grandmother, um, she had experiences and her, her brother was one of the, uh, encountered the Foo Fighters in World War II. Mm-hmm. So, you know, yeah, we have a history of it too. I wanted to just say, and then I'll get back to your family, but I just wanted to say before I forget, cause I, I was, I was saying that was strange with the, uh, large insects, but I remember when I was, um, under 10, I'd say, and there was a, there's a stairwell in my house, that, which, which is the portal. And my mother would not let us open the doors of the stairwell. There was a door on the top end and the bottom end, and there was another staircase, so we didn't use it. And so, of course, my girlfriend and I said, we're going to get in this thing, you know, when you're told no, little girls want to go, you know, figure out what's going on with that. So we fighting, we worked on it for weeks. We got this door open upstairs. And when we opened it, there was a giant spider. Uh, it took up a whole six foot window. The whole thing was taken up by this spider. And we both screamed and closed the door. And we're, we're, we're just, we're just going, that isn't logical. That can't be real. <laughs> we didn't just see that, but we did. So, see? Uh, and then of course I, I had the mansions and they're, they're insectoid and that thing, um, I was 10 or 11, 12 years old and it was holding me like I was a newborn. So you get the size of that holding a 10 year old human female, like I was just born and she was kind to me she's very loving and she gave me a lot of healing energy so anyway so back to your family so so you're saying you've got a lot of your 
family members, female, that have come together and said, me too. That happened to me too. Well, it wasn't until I turned 50 uh, that I got that call from my birth mother who said she saw a, a TV show and heard about the support group that I run and she felt that it was time that she told me about the story of my birth and why she was unable to keep me. She had a lot of extraterrestrial interference and nobody believed her. Eventually she was shut down uh, completely, uh, unable to express her story where her psychologist told her that she risked possibly losing her other kids because she was sounding crazy. And so she had a very difficult time. I didn't know any of this till I was 50, but now I know why wow. she never had a relationship with me. But my father um, indicated things, um, and my uh, uh, paternal grandmother also and maternal grandmother both had experiences. And I remember that my grandmother said something like this. It was uh, a cool, sunny fall morning. She said the corn had just been plowed. And the stalks were really low in the field. And she had just come out of the farmhouse. She had like a work dress on and a basket of laundry balanced on her hip. She turned the corner of the house to like pin the laundry on the line. And she lifted her face up and she saw in the sky. She felt, she thought it was the sun was warm. And she lifted her face up and it was a, a UFO was hovering over the cornfield and she didn't know much about flying saucers is what she called it she said she didn't know much about flying saucers then and uh, she said she is a good christian woman she took pride in the fact that she had never cursed or drank or smoked a day in her life but she said for a moment for a moment in time she was completely frozen but her practical part of herself really made her snap out of it because she was concerned she said that she didn't want to drop the clean laundry because the old ringer washer was such a hassle and she didn't want to have to do that load of laundry again but she had that flying saucer sort of wobbled and it tilted and then without a sound it silently lifted straight up into the sky there was a bit of a flash and that's the year that I learned my grandmother had many secrets and she started telling me it began in the, in the fall there of 1939 and she told me she then later had twins and uh, something was up with the, one of the twins which turns out was my father oh what was up with your father well um he insisted that he was E.T. for one um, out on the farm where there wasn't a whole lot of that and he didn't have access to TV or anything. There'd be the odd radio show, I guess, that uh, the family would sit around and listen to. But um, maybe if there was money, he might get a comic book from town. But uh, there wasn't a lot of E.T. or flying saucer information, as my grandmother would say. But he would talk about them. I didn't really take it seriously because by the time I was born and living on that very same uh, farm uh, with my grandma, um, I was seeing things that I just thought everybody else was and didn't really realize that nobody else was. <laughs> and so my, <laughs> my my level of norm was, was pretty expanded. I mean, uh, but it, I think it started really simply with my sensing, well, I would, didn't know if I was seeing or feeling color, <laughs> um, but it was color um, around people and it was how they felt. Um, I knew what was sort of happening with them and whether or not, um, you know, it was a good idea to be around them at that moment. But um, I just sort of had this etheric um, violet colored energy would uh, sort of, it would represent itself in a feminine form. I would just sort of see the silhouette and it um, guided me in a, a gentle, a permissive way, always asking my permission, always calling me by name. 
And so over the years, uh, decades now of research, it's been my personal experience that I choose not to have any form of relationship with any extraterrestrial that does not address me by my name, that is not aware of my humanity, and that has no... I find that the ones that don't address me by my name are self-serving and don't respect us, uh, perhaps using us in some way for whatever reason. Um, and so I, I choose not to, to engage at that point. Um, and I do have a, a, a very good way of blocking or mm, rebounding uh, specific energies that I sense and that I, that I don't feel are, are kind or loving or permissive. I mean, uh, yeah, don't come like a thief in a night. What would you, I mean, what would you give for a, a, a shield or a, a, a protector? What's, what, is there a, a, a invocation that works? You know, actually there is a very good grounding a verbal technique is to make a specific declaration that you are one with the grand of totality and will only receive or engage with information that comes from a higher consciousness. And that's it. Then that door is closed or that door is open. I, and I personally don't uh, want to, I, at one time, maybe in my youth, I might have thought, okay, well, you know, I'm psychologically prepared. I'll have a, some type of conversation with a ET, but you know, <laughs> They've been here and interfering and interacting for a very long time. And they're not really giving us pearls of wisdom. What they're doing is creating more of a division of separateness uh, with the elite and uh, trading technology for certain things. This this is not good behavior. And, and I, for one, am fully willing Right or wrong, I'm, I'm brave enough to make a mistake. But I right now feel like absolutely a lot of them have no business interfering and I don't, I don't care what their past was. I know now that we have billions of people who are in pain and I'm going to tell you, I did the month in China. I have never seen such wounded people, such disempowered, fear-based people. And when the Chinese government pulled my workshop and said I couldn't teach personal empowerment, the name of my workshop was From Fear to Freedom. Oh, and, no. and, and I'm like, well, hang on here a minute. I'm not going quietly into the night here. I just had a crazy ass flight and, and I want to know why. I said, are you offended by the word freedom or are you offended with that, the fact that I can teach you how to move out of that fear into freedom? And then it just shut me down and said that I couldn't use the word empowerment. I couldn't do that workshop. So I redid the workshop, did the exact same workshop, but every time the word empowerment came up, I would use uh, personal inner peace instead of personal oh empowerment. Oh, my God. <laughs> and it's the same, same wow. word. <laughs> so, you know, we were really lucky, Wayne and I. Um, China was harsh, man. Um, I just couldn't wait to get back to America and have some real Chinese food. No, just kidding. Food <laughs> 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 was what, horrible. What the, oh my god! Go was, there. What the? Oh, what I was, was invited. Who, I was invited. invited. Oh. Yes, I was invited uh, to speak and teach at uh, in the Wudang Mountains. So prior wow. to, to going to oh, China. China. I was invited to Geneva, Switzerland, where I spoke for a Mandarin audience, and then I received anonymously 97 years of UFO information um, came into my email uh, from All in Mandarin, which uh, we took some time in uh, translating to find out what their experiences were there. Then, So then I'm speaking to that audience. I did half my presentation in Chinese. And then I got invited to China. I spoke at a couple of different venues and taught uh, multiple classes on spirituality. And 
uh, the first week there, I was in Xi'an, and I'm holding my cell phone, and my husband, Wayne, is looking over my shoulder, and we both look at each other because my phone said targeted <laughs> and download, <laughs> boom, and then blew up, and that was it. No more no more um, phone for me. Oh, my God. And, which I really needed to help translate and find directions and buy, you know, airplane tickets and train tickets and book hotel rooms and all that stuff you have to do. Yeah, so, um, you know, yeah, hated the food. Uh, I was absolutely horrible. No offense, but they will eat anything that moves. And um, I am just a little fussier than that, apparently. So, I, I yeah, I, I was hungry uh, a lot of <laughs> oh <my goodness. laughs> I'm like, I'll just have some more rice, just a little more rice, please. (laughs) Oh, wow. Yeah, it it, it was pretty bad. You don't know what you're eating. You you could be eating dog or something, right? Well, that was, well, yeah. And so when one time when we were in Laos, no, uh, no, yeah, we were in Vientiane, Laos, and uh, we're checking the menu. And I'm like, Wayne, that's puppy, man. That's dog. And so we went out into the street and around the back of the restaurant and sure enough there are all these puppies in the cages and I'm like how come they don't have food and water I'm like oh my god because they are the food and so we're trying to like I went back in and I talked to them and said you're gonna like serve these puppies oh my god they're so cute and oh my god they're like yeah we're serving those puppies and uh, I'm like yeah I don't think so so I went back out and I'm trying to pick the locks and all of a sudden they hit this button and the door, this big garage door that like comes running down and, and I, like it's getting lower and lower to the ground and I'm not giving up. I'm not quitting and I'm shaking the cage now. And then we hear like, rear, rear. I'm like, Oh my God, they called the cops. So we had to like tear off down the alley and we're like running as fast as we could and, <laughs> and Moving in and out of alleys until we, you know, finally got back to our bungalow. I'm like, oh god, okay, we better not do that again. But uh, oh, yeah, oh my so, god, so, Laurie, yeah. you are the warrior. <laughs> <laughs> You're gonna free the puppies. Well, yeah, well, I sure didn't want to eat them. Okay, it was just like, all right, more rice. I'll just take the rice and something green. Yeah, yeah it was hard. So I guess so, you're not going back again next year. <laughs> you're not doing the annual tour. Well, oh. Actually, well, sat, interestingly, the college um, that I taught at um, said that they would like to to do a long term uh, 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 engagement with me. They would like me to come back every a year for several months and um, and teach uh, personal empowerment, uh, the chakra system. What I was teaching uh, uh, was some goddess, divine feminine goddess energy, and I used Quan Yin because, interestingly enough, she's been uh-huh. one of my favorite goddesses anyway because I'm all about um, mercy, compassion, uh, second chances, and giving a person the opportunity and the tools, you know, to self-correct. Because if you don't know, man, how can you change it if you don't know, right? So, yeah, so, but um, as we were leaving China, um, it was, they started arresting Canadians. And I'm Canadian. For what? Oh, well, because we're Canadian. Oh, because the, what was a big cell phone, Wawawu cell phones there, their CEO had screwed over a bunch of um, American financiers and investments and tied them to some Iranian investment. And it was like just some horrible back end stuff. Well, she was flying. She was like, she was, were warrant for her arrest in America. She was flying through Canada, through Vancouver and Americans asked the Canadians to extradite her, to hold her and then oh, extradite her. So Canada did because that's the rule of our law. And we are sister countries and blah, blah, blah. So Canada held her. And um, China said, oh, Canada, you are in big trouble. And boom, started doing these arrests. Canadians are just disappearing there, being put into what they call black box prisons. And we got out a couple of days before they started doing that. So I'm pretty grateful. I don't know if I want to go back. Um <sighs> God, so are you, are you Canadian? Are you saying you're Canadian? 
born, raised, and educated. Yes, I'm Canadian. Oh, and so wow, my husband, you're Canadian. Yeah, I've got a green card. Oh, eh? my goodness. Eh? Uh, yeah, that's right. I, I've got a green card, and for uh, I immigrated here legally um, back in, uh, I don't know, like 86. That's right. It was 1986. Oh, okay. mm-hmm. So you were sweating it out. <laughs> <laughs> oh. Yeah, so no, I I've kept it. my uh, Canadian citizenship, and I have to renew my green card every ten years. I got to go to Homeland Security, and last time I was there, they're like, uh, "Hey, you know, you can become a citizen." And I'm like, "I am a citizen, but you know, I'm another country." And they're like, "No, <laughs> it's on sale. It's like you can renew your green card for six hundred and fifty bucks, or you can apply for citizenship for four fifty. And you only have to do it once, so it's a better deal. They're telling me, I'm like, oh, it's okay, I'll, I'll just stay Canadian. <laughs> <laughs> so just, Interesting. Just, wow. Yeah, yeah, just abuse me. All this stuff I hear about immigration, and, you know, I've gone through it and continuously going through it. My kids have to go through it. One was born here, one was not. So <laughs> it's all very interesting. But, uh, yeah, I'm Canadian. Oh, cool. Uh, Sasha, questions, comments? Yeah, so, Laurie, uh, I, I want to hear what you got to say about the Mandala effect and what the collider is going to do. Oh, yes. Oh, yes. Okay, so I was in Geneva, and CERN is about 18 miles from there. And I thought, okay, well, I'm going to request a private tour and get into CERN (laughs) and see what I can find out, right? You know, I don't know, maybe the tour guide will look the other way and I can sneak into some office. I don't know what's going to happen, but I'm willing to try. And um, I all set to go and (coughs) went to lay down by the pool and hang out for a little bit before I was off to CERN. And man, it was like somebody just hit me with, uh, I got the worst migraine headache. Then I got an earache. Then I got a toothache. And I, could, I was debilitated. I couldn't even move. I was literally lying in a fetal position in the hotel room and thinking, what the hell just happened? But in retrospect, I'm thinking, hey, you know, probably somebody stopped me from getting myself arrested and at CERN. <laughs> But I do believe that uh, the Mandela effect, um, I think that there's a fluidity in time. And I think that as our universe expands, other universes expand, I think they might bump together. If we look at the M theory in math, the four different quadrants of physics, and you begin to see how quantum physics really creates um, the possibility for these other dimensions that they might just bleed through and information can slightly overlap or bleed through another dimension and make these changes. Time is fluid and there really is, there's so much that's illusion. I do believe that time is uh, connected to gravity and that that particular gravitational force in time, when we begin to understand those types of adjustable coordinates we can sort of time travel from our within our own third dimensional timeline and possibly into other dimensions quantum computers pull information from other dimensions so i'm quite sure that in a parallel universe there's another cern with another quantum computer and those computers are already talking to each other And absolutely, we're going to see some big pushes in artificial intelligence and Mm -hmm. we're going to see uh, some changes. Now, 
Obviously, the big one was the Berenstein Bears. And whenever I research anything uh, for the Mandela Effect, I use uh, Logopedia.com to check out the changing logos when they're registered, or I do a deep dive into the United States Patent Office and go through hundreds of pages of documents to find what I'm looking for, like with the product Febreze. I found that... It was F-E-B-R-E-E-Z-E, and, you know, now there's just the one E, which is for Brez, oh. not Febreze. Okay, so these changes, um, what was, um, what we think to be always the same, somebody has a completely different take on it. Um, and one of the strange things, too, is all of these, you know, the big one that I think almost everybody has to experience is Star Wars, where, you know, Darth Vader says, Luke, I am your father. That no longer is in the movie. In fact, they say it never was. That never happened. But I can assure you, every kid in my neighborhood was running around with their hands over their mouth going, Luke, I am your father. Doesn't say that. You have your old VHS or DVD, you play that. It now says no. I am your father. No, 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 no. It said, Luke, I am your father. <laughs> your father. <laughs> so that's a, that's a big Mandela effect. Um, Mr. Rogers neighborhood is another one with the words of the song. All of these. Oh, um, what's, what's different now? What's well, different? what is it now? What? Okay. I believe it was, um, Okay. The word went from this neighborhood, uh, and it was the. Uh, if, if you remember how the first, you remember how the first line of the song goes. I thought it's a one o'clock day in the neighborhood. Yeah, a beautiful day. Now it says a beautiful day in this neighborhood. It's a beautiful day in this neighborhood. And it was always, yeah, it's yeah, yeah, a beautiful yeah. day in the neighborhood. Won't you be my neighbor? And so, yeah, there are little changes like that. But there's many of these Mandela effects, especially the ones that have taken place in the Bible, for instance. Um, the lion and the lamb. Well, that's just not in there now. It's the lion and the wolf. They're saying that there's no lion in the lamb. So I don't know why the hell Elvis Presley ever sang that song. Because that's not in there. Um, but we all believe that we've all seen the statues, we've all seen the posters, we've all seen it, but, but that's not in there anymore. And of course, the Lord's Prayer, uh, there's a very significant change in that. And you're going to push my memory here, but I, <laughs> it's all about memory, right? <laughs> but, uh, but right. The, in, in the Lord's Prayer is, um, uh, for, uh, it's instead of being fr- in this world, it says on earth. It says in earth now instead of on earth. On earth wow. Wow. is in heaven. It says in earth now instead of in on. Earth. So that, that, oh my. that that's simulated weird. reality stuff. <laughs> so uh, when I was young, I was taken on board a mothership and shown twenty-four timelines, and uh, and they were very close to each other, but they had distinct differences. The worst case scenario, the planet Earth blew up. The best case scenario, we had a utopian. And there was everything in between. There were 24 of them. Um, And then I guess I was kind of, I get, I got to choose. At the highest level, we get to choose which timeline we want to be in. So maybe on some level, we decided to go in the Mandela effect to a slightly different timeline. Well, I think you can experience all of them. Um, as long as these timelines are, yeah, as long as they're all in the third dimensional world, uh, these are third dimensional timelines and we'll continuously experience each and every one of them until the person's consciousness has reached human attainment. Then you begin the ascension process. 
because the ascension process is moving up. It's moving from the third, fourth, fifth dimensional consciousness thinking as opposed to being flipped back and brought back and looped over into the third dimension, third dimension over and over. So we have to be very, very careful and clear as to what our intent is, what we think we are, what we think our purpose is, and where we want to make that next step. Is it going to be into another third dimensional reality? Are we going to play out every possible scenario? Because that will happen because that's how consciousness Consciousness is. It's going to fill every corner, mm-hmm. every possibility. So Earth herself is on the ascension path. So in 600 to 611, in the Dark Ages, when man was at its most torturous, the planet herself was as far away from the sun and the cosmology of the universe as possible. We weren't receiving specific solar rays that activated DNA that enlightened our consciousness. Now, right now, in 2019, the Earth herself is on an upswing. We're in the higher third dimension. We can move quickly, rapidly into the fourth dimension where we will have instant manifestation of our thoughts. So our emotional energy must be balanced. Fourth dimension is very short-lived. Then on the ascension path, we'll slide higher into that fifth dimension, which is more of a golden time. That's what I saw. That's what they showed me. I understand it now uh, deeper and deeper every single day, every step I take. I, I get it. And so, so tell I, me about when they, sh- what was going on? They showed that to you. When was that? How old were you? I was, was 30. I was 32 years old and I had just done a shitload. Oh, can I say that? Uh, a bug. Yeah, I can say it. Yeah. Of emotional <laughs> work. You know, I have uh-huh. forgiven. I have grown. I took a hard look at myself. I, I looked at religion, I saw things, and of course I was having experiences, but then what happened, this is what happened, I'm just going to tell you the truth, I was walking to my bedroom, the kids had just been put to sleep and lunches were packed for school, homework was done, it was a standard night in our house, I walked um, into my bedroom and I heard my name called. I heard my name two or three times and I turned around and it was like I was seeing into two worlds at the same time. There were three silhouettes of those violet beings. They sounded feminine, but super fast, high, rapid, high frequency voices. They told me Uh I had passed and I thought they told me I died. When they said I passed, I sort of hung my head and said, oh, okay, I, I died. And they said, no, you passed. Then they asked me, are you afraid? And I said, no, I'm not afraid. I really, I've been waiting for you all of my life. They said, would you like to see? I said, I would like to see. And in that moment, I rose up and I could feel myself move through different densities of space. And then all of us, it was like I was in like a, violet uh, energy was all around me and I was moving up and all of a sudden everything stopped and I couldn't see what was in front of me I could still feel the other entities behind me very loving the ones in front of me I couldn't see but I felt as though they had evaluated me as if they had judged me somehow and then in the next moment I just burst into space my eyes that were like light years between them. I went to look down to see where my body was and there was no body. There were just stars and I'm so naive. I could only say I'm, I'm still Lori. And they laughed. They did. They laughed. And I understood the innocence of my statement. And then I began to see the golden planet, the higher frequency and it was a higher frequency. And it was this most brilliant, as though illuminated from within, this golden color. And I understood. There felt like there were beings there that were so bright. They had to wear, like, capes or something to hide the 
brightness from me. And, and it was all really amazing. Then, then, um, I had to go back. And I, I said, but I, I don't really, I don't know your name. I don't know your name. I, please come back. And three nights later, they did come back and they took me again and showed me this peace, this unconditional quiet love. And I felt, um, like, at, from that moment forward, I've lived my life the way I wanted to live. I've tried everything. I've pushed the boundaries. I feel just kind of like what Socrates and Plato said. If you knew for sure the truth about self, you would live on the edge, always pushing every envelope because there is no death. And there's this multi right. self. So... That's what I learned. I love it. Mm. That's a wonderful story. <laughs> it changed my life. I've never been the same. And, you know, Janet, I spent two years after that trying to figure out what it was all about. I can so relate to experiences no matter what. But I was like, were they aliens or were they angels? And then I've after two years... I came to the conclusion that it didn't really matter. No, it doesn't. <laughs> no. They were, were alien angels. There you go. <laughs> they were celestial beings that showed me a love. They, they vibrated something in me that right. uh, created a higher frequency. And, and I, I've never been the same. Yeah, I think once you encounter that, you, you well, you still have to get up and walk among, and you know, eat, breathe, go to the bathroom, you know. Well, sleep. they they worked yeah, out that so I got all the help that I needed. Um, I started having some really lucid dreams. You know, by the time that happened, I'd already been meditating for twelve years, and I kept constantly right. out of my body every time. I would just full on pop right out of my body and um, had a dream about this temple and the next day driving around the countryside um, randomly, I saw the temple that I had just dreamed about. I went in, um, there were two female monks, it's an all women temple, even the master is a female, and they said, um, why have you come here? I said, I've come to meditate, and I did. I came to meditate on what the hell was happening to me. And uh, <laughs> and uh, they said, how did you know about us? And I said, I dreamed you. And one went and ran for the master, and they opened the gates. And for the next five years, they taught me more about other worlds and extraterrestrials and how to control my mind and my energy than I have learned from the thousands of cases that I've worked. They wow. they taught me. Um, I would do eighteen hour meditation marathons with them. I did learn how to control my mind, which is obviously why I became a hypnotherapist. Right. What what years was this? Those were from nineteen ninety two, maybe ninety one. Um, up until about 94, 95, right in there. So my son, um, I remember he came before he started school and then he came, I went all the way through to the third grade and then I, I finished, I went at the same, I was also going to school. Um, and, uh, I moved to, uh, Albuquerque to finish becoming a clinical hypnotherapist in Santa Fe. And so yeah, he was about, nine by then so he has four or five years at the temple and i really am grateful uh, for everything you know they don't they don't give you a lot man why one two three words at a time right so you got to phrase your uh -huh. question wisely <laughs> and Where, what is this temple what what part of the world was this temple in oh it's Where right up it's, right it's just right here out in the 
uh, strawberry fields um, and cow farms of Sacramento. It's about um, oh. Yeah, uh, yeah. I dropped my kids off at school and went for a ride in the country, and um, there it was. I was like, "Watch, get out of here!" <laughs> so they were so kind and um, amazing, and so intuitive and so telepathic. You know, they really, really allowed me. I mean, it was like probably the best therapy I ever had. Uh, but I, but my big issue in going to them was. Every time I meditated, it pop out of my body. So my focus was on meditation and control of the mind. And I learned. What did I learn? I learned that I'm still Lori when I'm outside mm-hmm. of my body. I can still go anywhere, do anything. But I didn't know then. I didn't know how far I could go. I didn't know how far to walk away from myself. I didn't know. I didn't know that I could exist inside and outside of the body simultaneously, but oh, do we ever. Right. We're running out of time. Sasha, what would you like to say? Well, I, I just, uh, I find it very interesting uh, uh, when I regress people, if first uh, I have them separate uh, into each of their subpersonalities and regress the different subpersonalities. They have their own mandala effect. Each of them, your inner child will have a different memory than your inner Aphrodite and then your inner hero will. Uh, and uh, they, 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 they keep influencing each other's realities or as they accept or reject or compromise with them. And it's, it's, it's in this clash of the different, uh, the different yous inside that you can center yourself among them and get some kind of perspective. Right. And then eventual full integration. Of the uh, sub, of the sub uh, personalities, is that there's a full, true, authentic self emerges, and that's mm-hmm. a beautiful thing. Yeah. I mean, How do you make sure your, your mic was down? Mine. I, I think it's okay. It's okay now. We have just like a, one minute, Lori. How do people get in touch with you? Your website. Uh, my website is trueyouhypnotherapy.com. You can uh, follow me at uh, um, at Lori's True You on Twitter, um, on Facebook, just my name. Also, there's a True You Hypnotherapy page. I'm also having a, a workshop uh, coming up in October. You can check that out at femininegoddessesretreats.com. And also doing a workshop at the Return of the Sky Gods, uh, Earth Avatars Conference. It's a very long name. I hope I got it right. In uh, Shasta in September. Oh, good. Wow. Yeah. So if you're well, in the area, so much. Out. <laughs> yes. come on by. Yes. And um, thank you so much for coming on. Our music should be coming. Here it is. Thank you, everybody. Much love and blessings. And aloha. Thank you, I'm thank Matt Baker. Thank you, Laura McDonald. Thank you, listeners. Love everybody. Aloha. Say aloha, honey. <laughs>
And Studio B is 716-748-0112. Thank you very much for listening to Revolution Radio, freedomslips.com, the number one listener-supported radio station in the world. Hey, everyone. It's Barbara Jean Lindsay, the Cosmic Oracle. If you have questions about your past lives or future plans, need answers from the cosmos about your love life or career, or just want to keep your finger on the pulse of the planet, check out my show, The Cosmic Oracle, here on Revolution Radio at freedomslips.com. Thanks for tuning in to Revolution Radio. Here at Revolution Radio, we are listener sponsored and commercial free, but there still are bills to pay. In order to raise some needed funds to cover the cost, our station is offering a silver special. In the continental United States for a $60 donation, or in Alaska, Hawaii, or Canada for a $70 donation, we will send you an uncirculated 2018 one ounce pure silver eagle. The $70 donation, uh, the extra 10 is to cover shipping, by the way, outside of the continental United States. When making the donation, you must put Silver Eagle promo in the notes on the donation. And thank you for tuning in to Revolution Radio at revolution.radio and freedomslips.com. Without you, there is no us. Revolution Radio, where information never sleeps. Looking for a nightcap to fill your listening needs? Come join us on Spaced Out Radio with me, Dave Scott, right here on Revolution Radio. Monday through Friday for three hours a night, starting at 9 p.m. Pacific, midnight Eastern, we will take you down the supernatural path. From ET contact to the paranormal and all of the spiritual, cryptid, and conspiracy stories in between, you can find us right here on Revolution Radio at SpacedOutRadio.com on Twitter. 